like to thank uh, the Hurricane Vets uh, Charitable Trust for giving me this opportunity uh, to share with you the, uh, I, I can't say imminent threat because the threat is already at our doorsteps, it's already there inside. So how we can react to this threat and then how we can prepare, especially in those states which don't have any idea what this disease is going to bring about. And for those states that are having this disease now, how they can manage the situation and how they can react uh, to this, especially our friends in the northeastern part of India, the Seven Sisters, they are going to be largely affected because uh, the major pork producers and pork eating population are present in that region. So I welcome all the colleagues and uh, fellow uh, scientists and uh, veterinarians and resource people from the northeast of India, especially. And I also see some participants from overseas, especially from University of Bari in Italy and another person from Cairo. So I welcome you both as well. So to start with, uh, thanks for the introduction, Srini. So I'm going to talk about this African swine fever. Yeah, and that's the name suggests that it from Africa. So I'll go through each one, one of my presentations. It's going to be a, to start with, it's going to be a 30 to 35, 40 minute session. Uh, we can have the question and answer session at the end. We'll try to cover as many questions as possible. Leave your questions, your name and your email ID. If you're not able to answer the question in this session, we'll try and contact you by email, and then we can have a discussion there. So this is a general knowledge about the disease, introduction about the disease, and then just to create awareness about the disease. Some people may know more about the disease, uh, fair and good, but for those people who think that this is going to be a new disease and how they're going to look at the disease in the field, it's just an eye opener. So. All these informations are there in the public domain. People have researched on this and published. So I'm sharing the knowledge with you guys. So I come from an institute called the Australian Center for Disease Preparedness. It was formerly called the Australian Animal Health Laboratory. It belongs to the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organization, a primary institute in Australia. So I would like to thank all my teachers who have imparted me this knowledge, and then I pray to them that I can share my knowledge with all you guys, because they are the ones who cut a coal into a diamond. So my prayers and my uh, namaskarams are my salutations to all my teachers. So African swine fever, why are we talking it today and why we didn't talk about this yesterday? because we all knew that this disease was in our doorsteps. When China reported the outbreak in 2018-19, we should have been prepared for this disease because once a disease enters a continent, it spread fast. After China, Vietnam reported the disease and then all the Southeast Asian countries reported the disease. Worst come worst, Myanmar reported the disease and the Tibetan part of China reported the disease but where are we prepared for the disease? Unfortunately, we have the incidents at door. So this was one of the reports that was sent from the uh, OE Reference Laboratory for Avian Influenza, which is in Bhopal. It is named as the ICR National Institute of High Security Animal Diseases to the Secretary, Ministry of Animal Husbandry. And then they were talking about some samples that, that they have received from two states in India, uh, both from the Northeast part of India, Arunachal Pradesh and Assam. And they have listed the number of samples and what is they have done. They have done some five different tests. And then finally they gave the result, which everybody didn't want to know that 17 tissue samples from Assam were positive for the ASFP genome, 
the PCR and sequencing, and some of the samples from Arunachal Pradesh were also positive. So the crux of the matter is the disease that was a threat in our neighborhood is now in India now. And then we had to report to the OIE, and so we can't claim that India is free from ASF now because we have the disease. Yes. But we should make efforts now to ensure that the, this disease doesn't spread across India. I just went and tried to Google why pig pop Indians, they love their sheep and goat, mutton, chicken. In some parts of the country, they have beef. Is pig production a big thing in India? Why should we be bothered at all? about the pig disease in India, because we don't get to learn more about the pig diseases when we do our veterinary course in India. But unfortunately, my thought process was wrong because this particular publication in 2017 showed that we have a 2% population of livestock, which is piggery, which is estimated as around 10 million. And surprisingly, we are ranking fifth in the world after China, Denmark, and all those major pig producing countries, Australia, etc., we are ranking fifth in the world. So that means there is a big population in India who rear pigs for their livelihood. And then most of the pigs that are reared in India, that is almost 90% of the pigs, are found in rural areas. That means this is a source of income to people who are poor, marginal, and then they're not captured under any systematic rearing of pigs. And most of the pigs in India, almost 75% are indigenous animals. So commercial piggery is only 23%, but other piggery is like 75% is indigenous. That's where it gets interesting to know about the disease. It's a very highly contagious disease. It causes hemorrhagic disease of swine. There are other diseases also of swine, which look similar, which are hemorrhagic diseases. Example, classical swine fever. It is an OIE notifiable disease. That means any incidence of African swine fever must be reported to the OIE. Fortunately, under the current COVID situation, this is not a disease of zoonotic importance. So it doesn't transmit from animals to human. But the disease can occur in many forms. It can occur as a peracute disease, that is, without the clinical signs, the animal may die. Acute disease, subacute. The worst part is it can thrive as a chronic or in asymptomatic forms. That's where the problem comes. If a disease sets in a population or a country or a geographical area, the chronic and the asymptomatic forms are the most problematic ones because Getting freedom from infection or disease will be difficult if it goes into those two stages. Virulent strains can occur and they cause death within seven to 10 days in case of acute and subacute diseases. In peracute and acute cases, it's 90 to 100% mortality. Subacute and chronic cases around 70 to 80% mortality. So here we are looking at somewhere around 70 to 100% mortality rate in almost all the cases especially in young pigs, and then around 40% mortality in adult pigs. And there can be pigs that do not show any symptoms, but they may be positive, and they die off. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, there is no computer. So this virus belongs to the ASF virus genus of the Aspharidae family. It's an enveloped virus. So other enveloped viruses are the vesicular stomatitis virus, the rabies virus, etc. So this is also a uh, enveloped virus. There are 20 different genotypes. So if you want to make a vaccine, you have to have vaccine for 20 different genotypes or at least many vaccine strains that can cover all the genotypes. The virus has a capsid, and this capsid encodes a double-stranded DNA. It's a very large DNA, 170 bases. 
to 193 bases. So the DNA is also variable in size. And it encodes for around 150 to 167 proteins. This virus can survive extremely high pH conditions. That's where the type of disinfectant that is used in the farms for regular operations, they will not be useful for this control of this virus. So the pH is 4 to 10. That means you should have. Can somebody mute their microphone, please? So the pH is 4, that is either less than 4 or more than 10. And the disinfectants you can think of is either a strong acid or a strong base, like hydrochloric acid or uh, um, sodium hydroxide, which cannot be used normally. So there is an electron microscope picture that is given here in the left and then off your screen and then the virus structure in the right of the screen. So it is an envelope virus, which has an outer envelope, the capsid proteins, an inner membrane, and then it's got a matrix protein and then the genomic DNA. So this is the complex organization of the genome. You can see that to, to cover around 150 to 167 proteins, the genome is arranged like this. So many proteins are synthesized. Most of the proteins are synthesized both in the 5 prime to 3 prime region or from 3 prime to 5 prime. So in both directions, the proteins can form. And then there are some proteins, we don't know what functions they have. That means to make a gene deletion or an attenuated vaccine it becomes very difficult because we don't know what functions these proteins have. Do they have a role in the replication of the virus, assembly of the virus, or killing the host mechanism? We don't know. That's why it's very difficult virus to handle. Considering the molecular epidemiology, I told you it has got more than 20 strains. So far, there are 24 genotypes based on the B64, B646L gene for protein 72. There are 24 genotypes. Of these 24 genotypes, 22 are restricted to Africa, but two genotypes are found outside Africa. And genotype one used to be present in Europe. And then the genotype two has spread almost in all of Europe and as well as in Asia now. So this is the complex uh, phylogenetic structure of the different genotypes. Here you can see all the current outbreaks belong to this genotype two here, which is clustered here. The European strains that are currently prevalent in Europe and the Asian strain from China and other parts of Asia are currently in this part here. And then based on the serology, there are around eight serotypes and the Asian serotypes are present in serotype number eight. So it's a very complex uh, disease and a complex virus. So as you know, then the detection of the right serotype and the right genotype becomes very, very important in diagnosis and to see the source of the infection. So far, the phylogenetic of the Indian isolates have not been revealed because the results came out only around 24th of April. So the sequences are there. They have to publish the sequences and draw the phylogeny. Given the geographical region of the outbreak, possibly it could be genotype two. <coughs> could have come from the neighboring countries of Myanmar or Tibetan China. So the species that are affected are mostly wild pigs. So this is actually a disease of Africa in wild pigs. What hearts, bush pigs, they are known reservoirs of this disease and they don't suffer from the disease. They just persistently carry the infection both horizontally and vertically. There are other wild pigs such as the giant forest hogs that are susceptible and the disease in Europe is mainly because of the Eurasian wild boars. 
in some countries the disease can spread from these wild animal hosts into domestic pigs and then once it reaches the domestic pigs it can form a cycle within the domestic pigs because of various reasons another major aspect of the spread is through feral swine that is these pigs which are not taken care of by any farming practice but they are there roaming around the streets or the countryside and if they get infected they will be a constant source of infection to all the animals to get to the history in 1921 the disease was first identified in kenya that's why it was called african horse sickness because they thought it was classical swine fever but uh, uh, sorry african swine fever but it was not classical swine fever today almost the whole of sub saharan africa the african continent countries below the sahara desert including the island of madagascar is endemic to different genotypes at least 22 genotypes outside of africa it occurred in 1957 so how did this happen after the world war 2 when people started moving when people started leaving africa decolonization happened and these people started moving from africa into europe they started taking materials from africa to europe along with that they also took the wild pigs the pig products the bush meat and then it spread into portugal then it spread from portugal to spain then it spread throughout europe in 70s and 80s one of the major discoveries that was made was in 1963 when they identified the softic ornithodorus species uh the genus so then they realized that this tick within africa is transmitted by the soft ticks getting infected from infected what hogs or the wild pigs and then that sylvactic cycle was being maintained later the disease spread to the western hemisphere into the americas cuba dominican republic haiti and brazil in the 1990s there were efforts from the european union to eradicate the disease and they successfully eradicated the disease from europe and the americas but even today the genotype 1 is endemic in a small island called sardinia in italy It, so these animals are persistently infected they are not able to get rid of infection from these animals at all because the ticks in those in that island have got infected so that is one major epidemiological feature that india should consider because if the ticks in india get infected especially the soft ticks then it becomes a cycle between the soft ticks and the pigs in 2007 there was a report of a dead hog in georgia that's when they identified this was in georgia bulgaria border somewhere and they identified the disease there in 2007 that was the first time the disease was noticed in the eastern europe how it reached eastern europe nobody knew because it was not the same genotype 1 but it was genotype 2 so it was a different genotype how did it escape from africa into eastern europe nobody knows then it spread across the caucasus eurasia including russian federation it almost conquered all the eastern europe latvia lithuania estonia ukraine poland hungary romania bulgaria so now it is an endemic cycle there in eastern europe amongst the wild pigs but in 2015 because iran closely borders the western countries they had the, they reported the first incidence of this disease in asia in 2015 so this was a major major blow to the asian continent because a previously unknown disease struck asia and in 2018 china first time reported the disease in domestic pigs that's when the alarm bells rang because as long as the disease was in wild boars nobody bothered but when domesticated pigs got infected there was pick to pick transmission and the virus spread fast it spread into vietnam thailand and philippines 
And between 2019 to 2020, there was severe underreporting of the disease from several Southeast Asian countries. They didn't want to declare the disease. And recently in 2020, Papua New Guinea, which is around 80 miles from Australia, had the disease. And we from our laboratory have confirmed the occurrence of ASF in Papua New Guinea. So it's a threat to the food security in a country like Australia, where they don't import any meat products from outside. And as you know now, in 2020, we have reported the disease from Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. So there are four epidemiological cycles or transmission cycles but that we need to understand. Uh, the sylvatic cycle is restricted to Africa. The tick pig cycle is also restricted to Africa, but it could also be found in Europe where the forest pigs are getting infected by the viruses from the ticks. The unfortunate thing is the domestic cycle, that is the cycle within the domestic pigs through direct infection, also through pig products, infected pig products. There is also a cycle called wild boar habitat cycle, where if the wild boars which are infected come in contact with the domesticated pigs, especially in those areas where the pigs are reared in a rural setting, it's not an organized farm, like most of the cases in India, where we find that 70%, 75% is like rural um, husbandry. So it's a major issue there. So what happens? So an infectious wild boar gets a disease. It could transmit to infectious, it could transmit to domesticated pigs, either through direct contact or accidental mating. Then it can be maintained in the domestic pigs. It can also be transmitted from infectious soft ticks. It could come from contaminated carcasses or food waste. If you are going to feed swill, then it is a big issue. If the swill is not treated properly. In most of the countries in Europe, America and Australia and New Zealand, feeding swill is prohibited. You can't feed swill. That is hospital waste, uh, uh, hostel waste, restaurant waste. We can't feed them. Even if we have to feed them, we have to boil it properly, not only for this case, but also for diseases like FMD. So we, sorry about this, it's bothering me. Gosh. It can also be transmitted by veterinarians who are trying to attend to these cases, hydrogenic transmission, and a sick pig, if you're trying to treat the pig, you're getting infected, you, your tools are getting infected, your boots, clothing, you can transmit the disease. Another major aspect is a politically sensitive issue called the Belt and Road Project. How did the disease genotype 2 come to China? This disease was present in Africa only. So you all know about the Belt and Road Project, which China builds roads and other infrastructures throughout the world. They employ Chinese laborers. And China is a poor producing and consuming country. So these people would have taken accidentally taken an infected pork product into China and then fed into those uh, pigs and the disease could have established there. So we don't have any uh, conclusive proof for it, but it's just a speculation. Clinical science, the incubation period is five to 15 days. All the pigs will have a pyrexia, more than 40.5 degrees Celsius. Depression, leading to decreased activity. The most important sign that you will notice is skin lesions. You will have blue or red marks all over the body, especially at the extremities. A typical reddening of the ear, reddening of the uh, perineal surfaces, reddening of the limbs. Another important thing is the swelling of the hock joint. That's a very common sign in African swine fever. Swelling joints and lameness, congested lungs, some sows may abort. And this clinical sign varies between the virulence of the virus and also the route of exposure, breed of the animal, 
how much uh, dose of exposure and also depending on the nature of the disease whether it is per acute acute subacute or chronic so these are some of the important pictures that you should see carefully to identify the disease signs early so here from the left you see the nostrils and you have a bloody mucoid foamy nasal discharge this is very typical of uh, african swine fever it could also occur because of a normal injury also but sometimes this will be more pronounced in these animals a red color demarcation of the hindquarters you can see the red color demarcation uh, it's because of the cutaneous hemorrhage it's a hemorrhagic disease that means it affects the endothelial vessels of the blood uh, vessels so you can see this cutaneous hemorrhage it's like the back is painted with some red color uh, same way the hyperemia of the hind legs the distant limbs then you will also see like these wart like marks a necrotic x-ray with sloughing from the skin it will look like a wart and also underneath the ears you can see the uh, cutaneous hemorrhage and necrosis so it it look like something like a chicken pox in in a pig something like that or a measles in a pig red patches everywhere throughout the body so the main antemortem inspection you should look at the nostrils the back of the animal with a red splash the extremities of the limbs uh, what like uh, projections with necrotic areas behind the ears on the ears and also on the uh, perineal skin so these are the signs that you can immediately look for in case of a sudden death in an animal or a suffering animal and if these signs are present you can suspect african swine fever but you can only suspect it cannot be confirmed because you need to differential diagnose against other conditions especially classical swine fever you'll find some animals dead and some animals lethargic some animals unable to move because of the lameness and then you will find these blue splashes all over the body this is because of the subcutaneous hemorrhage or percutaneous hemorrhage that has happened in these animals mostly these animals are identified dead so this is some of the pictures from philippines from the recent uh, outbreak necropsy carefully you have to perform necropsy as you as you open the uh, body cavity you will find fluid in the body cavity and pericardium it doesn't say much but still you will find a uh, fluid the most pathognomonic lesion or the striking lesion is the splenomegaly the spleen is almost the entire length of the animal it covers the whole abdomen of the animal normally spleen is a very small organ but in case of most of the viral diseases it, it enlarges but in case of african swine fever it enlarges enormously it becomes very huge organ so you can suspect that kidney discolored with petechial hemorrhages that means you will find red spots all over the kidney on top in your pathology they would have taught you ostrich egg shell appearance so you have red marks all over the capsule of the uh, kidney the lungs are congested heart and intestines you will find hemorrhage the gall bladder is enlarged uh, and then the lymph nodes you can find splashes of blood in the lymph nodes and then if you cut if you look at the mandibular lymph node you will find hemorrhage because it's a hemorrhagic disease the heart you'll find the subendocardial hemorrhage you'll find fluid in the pericardium and then if you see the lungs lung is non collapsed and edematous and there is dorsal hemorrhage and consolidation of the lung because of the rupture of the structures there stomach you will find pain brush like appearance as if there is a you have put some paint accidentally on the stomach you will find some red paint on the stomach this this part you see as if it is painted red accidentally then you will also find this focal blue colored spots where the blood is clotted and and you can also see that in 
the omentum part of the stomach. It's very clear. Because of the internal hemorrhage, the stomach is filled with blood, clotted blood. Colon, again, will find hemorrhagic lesions. Cecum, again, you'll have focal patches of hemorrhages. Kidney. Kidney strikes a very important picture because if you see, there is a retro peritoneal edema, and then the kidney, it looks like this like small red dots in the kidney, throughout the kidney, both kidneys. It will look like an ostrich shell. You can see the kidney, you can find, if, if these hemorrhages are close to each other, then you'll find a different colored kidney. It's like a blue kidney. If you cut open the kidney, you can find particular hemorrhages inside, throughout the cortex. Then urinary bladder, you'll find focal hemorrhagic lesions. So if you find hemorrhagic spots in any organ and it is disseminated, you can suspect African swine fever in case of pigs. But it cannot be diagnosed based on clinical signs or lesions alone because you can find such clinical signs in any other disease as well, classical swine fever, PWRRS, porcine circovirus, bacterial septicemias, erysipelas example, there is redness. Respiratory signs are similar to Ojewski's disease or pseudorabies. In case of non-infectious diseases, warfarin poisoning, aflatoxicosis, heavy metal poisoning, thrombocytopenia purpura, you can see these spotted hemorrhagic marks. So in this case, you make a primary assumption or suspect that it is African swine fever, but you need to collect sample and confirm in a laboratory. That's where the laboratory becomes an important part and the lab should be prepared to perform these tests. In India, there's only one lab that is authorized to do these tests so far. It's the high security lab in Bhopal. I hope the department takes, the ICR takes a strong view of this and uh, allow local labs, especially university labs, to help in testing these samples. The only problem is contamination of the labs. So we need to put in protocols, procedures to handle samples. Control measure, quarantine. That's the main, COVID would have shown us what quarantine means, what isolation means. So we need to isolate our animals as well. You need to quarantine the infected and suspected properties, stop all the movements of animals between farms during this uh, outbreak, cull all the animals that are showing signs of the disease. Cleaning and disinfection is very important, especially this virus can persist in organic matter for a long, long time. So as I said, the pH of the disinfectant is very important. It should be either less than four or more than 10. And two disinfectants can be easily be used here. One is sodium hypochlorite solution and citric acid. So sodium hypochlorite can give you pH less than, more than 10 and citric acid 0.2% will give you pH less than four. So it can reach around two as well. The important part is surveillance for the disease. Once you know that the disease is in your population, you need to educate the farmers about the disease the animal health staff, the paraveterinary staff, they have to be shown the pictures and they have to take the pictures if they are called to attend uh, lethargic animals or dead animals, dead pigs in, in farms. So surveillance is very important. And you can control the disease based on zoning. Currently the disease is only in northeastern states, so we can zone these animals from the northeastern states and, and ensure that None of the meat products reach the market to the other states in India. Mostly these, uh, these animals are lo for localized consumption, but sometimes people may smuggle goods outside of these places, and then this may reach other areas as well. You would have noticed some of the pictures in news columns and those things. Dead pigs thrown into rivers, dead pigs just 
dumped in front of river beds and then burned. This is a picture that was done, noticed in Korea when they had uh, this African swine fever. They just culled the pigs and then dumped it. And you could see the river, red river running. So we, didn't, we, we should not do such uh, uh, unhumane things to these animals. These animals have to be slaughtered properly and disposed of properly. Coming to sampling as veterinarians, we should know what to sample and how to sample. Uh, before collecting or sending any samples, the disease has to be notified first to proper authorities. Uh, the sample should be sent in a secure condition only to authorized labs. Don't send it to any unauthorized labs because they won't be knowing how to handle these samples. Uh, immediately notify your health authorities. Talk to your local animal husbandry authority, the uh, ADs and JDs in your assistant directors and joint directors in your uh, area. Talk to the nodal centers for disease diagnosis and confirmation. Talk to your state authorities and also to the ICAR. Uh, for a definitive diagnosis, we always need to collect a whole range of samples because the disease, can, the virus can be present in any organ. Uh, the only way to identify the disease early by laboratory testing is by PCR and followed by sequencing to identify the genotype. Serological tests are available. It is mostly a commercial test and uh, a laboratory-based uh, immunofluorescent test but it's of limited use because only in chronic animals or animals that are having persistent infection, you will find some serological response. Animals that are suffering peracute, acute, and subacute cases, there may not be enough time for the animals to mount an immune response, and these animals may die even before mounting a response. So we need to collect samples from at least 10 animals, dead or alive, so that we can compare uh, the results in different samples by doing the uh, immunofluorescence test or by doing uh, staining. So blood is very important. It can be, uh, it should be an EDTA blood to do PCR on the blood. Uh, some people also culture the virus from the blood using specialized cell lines. Uh, you can transport the swabs that are taken out from the peritoneal fluid or the uh, fluid in the lung or the pericardial fluid or even from the lymph nodes. You can take a swab and send it in viral transport medium. Uh, you need to collect these samples in different containers. You should not mix these samples. Uh, it's better to send the samples chilled, not frozen condition, not using dry ice. But if you're not having a gel pack or ice, you can put the sample in 50% glycerol saline, like normal, any other normal sample collection. You can take one part of glycerine, one part of uh, sodium chloride solution, normal saline, you can mix it, and you can send that to labs. Uh, from live pigs, you can collect blood. It can be used both for uh, the genome isolation, uh, the virus identification, and also for serology. You can collect the swabs from oral cavity, tonsils, nasal cavity, and from dead pigs, collect as many organs as possible. Wherever you see lesions, collect all those organs in uh, glycerol saline. And you carefully pack these uh, organs in tubes, uh, label them properly to make sure the lab knows which tube contains what organ. Prepare a detailed list of samples that you are sending, how many pigs you are sending, if possible, label the samples with the pig ID, uh, and then you can send it to the laboratory. In the laboratory, uh, normally they do a PCR. That's what the lab in uh, Bhopal did. Uh, they did a PCR on these samples, on the buried uh, tissue samples. Uh, they also did some serological assays using a commercial kit, but mostly it will give you a negative result. But some labs are equipped with doing virus isolation. That means they can isolate the virus, but it is difficult to culture the virus because these viruses grow only on alveolar macrophages or uh, uh, bone marrow cells. 
so that means you should have a normal pig you should slaughter the normal pig uh, that to an young pig collect the alveolar uh, macrophages using a lung lavage then you do a bone marrow culture and then only you can isolate the virus no other cell line is permissible so far to this uh, virus some people have used a cell line called WSL cell line which is from wild boar again but it is very difficult to get uh, wild boar cell lines uh, so this is the different stage of infection so if an animal gets infected as i told you it could take 5 to 15 days to show the clinical signs uh, in usual cases it could be a peracute or acute form with 100% lethality uh, around uh, second day or first day of infection until 35 days you can see the viremia with virus uh, in the blood or in the different organs then the, by day 12 the antibodies start coming up and reaches a peak after 35 days uh, by the time they become survivors you can see these antibodies but those animals which perish these antibodies may not be present because they'll be in subacute form or in chronic infection so in survivors and chronic infection you may find antibodies uh, there is a stage where the animals lie between the per uh, acute form and the chronic infection where the diagnosis is very difficult because the virus is going to come down the number of virus particles in the blood is being down but no antibodies that's where it's going to be very very uh, difficult to uh, diagnose the disease in the lab again uh, in case of an outbreak we should do both virus and antibody tests because we don't know when these animals got infected so it's always better to send samples both for uh, PCR virus based virus detection as well as for antibody tests in acute cases the virus detection PCR is very helpful that's what they did in the case in a uh, uh, case from Assam and Arunachal Pradesh prevention prevention is better than cure control comes later so preventing the disease is from direct transmission especially pick to pick transmission so we have to advise the farmers to isolate all the ill pigs and cull them and dispose them properly uh, these culled pigs should not find a way into food cycle and then go back to the animals as well that's the problem uh, we should ensure that uh, in areas where there are feral pigs and wild pigs they should not come in contact with the domesticated pigs uh, in southeast asia some of the farms are fenced but they have identified that these wild boars can dig in through the ground and they can get into the farms because they have their tusks so that they can dig through the ground and come inside the farm so we should uh, people who are rearing these pigs should have uh, proper housing with adequate flooring so that uh, they cannot be broken as in other diseases if you buy any new pigs they have to be quarantined for 30 days at least because we know the incubation period is around 5 to 15 days so that means we need to have two cycles of uh, infection so 30 days at least this is very very important do not feed uncooked pork products to pigs especially swill garbage and waste if a particular area has shown uh, african swine fever previously disinfection we have seen everything has to be dis disinfected properly even the veterinarian who is attending these animals should wear plastic clothing and then they have to be removed and disinfected properly using either 2 percent citric acid or 0.03 percent sodium hypochlorite solution all the manure and carcasses have to be appropriately dis uh, disposed or burnt if somebody has the habit of hunting wild hogs for passion they should not come in contact with domesticated pigs the most important thing is control of tick but the genotype 2 is known to spread from pig to pig so the role of soft ticks is questionable here however if the pig has a soft tick on its body the soft tick gets infected 
then it will establish a tick to uh, pig cycle and that will be very very difficult to control because getting rid of ticks from uh, population or uh, geographical area is very difficult because these ticks will live in the crevices they'll take a meal drop down go and live in the crevices and then once they are hungry again they'll come back and bite these animals so it's very difficult so if you find ticks talk to your parasitologist your local parasitologist whoever is there in your department or in your nearest uh, veterinary uh, colleges or veterinary schools <clears throat> talk to your parasitologist they will identify the tick as hard tick or soft tick and then from these ticks you can identify the virus by pcr so it is very difficult in endemic areas so we should not allow the disease to become endemic this is the major part the african swine fever resilience this is a very hard virus this virus is very very difficult to get rid of you can see most of the contaminated meat whether you store them at room temperature or you freeze them or you store in refrigerated conditions the virus survives in any part of the meat or blood even if it is a deboned meat or uh, the lymph nodes are removed this virus can survive for a long long time unless all these meat products are heated cooked at least for 30 minutes and at least at 70 degrees celsius that means you need to really boil the waste only if you boil the waste the virus get killed and then ensure that the lymph nodes are removed and not fed to these pigs because lymph nodes carry these viruses don't feed lungs don't feed kidneys don't feed the spleen if it is muscular tissue cook them properly and then uh, use as well but during the control phase you advise the farmers advise the people not to feed swill so that you can stop the cycle of pick to pick transmission uh, through uh, this route coming to the question that everybody has why can't we vaccinate do we have a vaccine as i told you there are 24 genotypes so it is very difficult to make vaccines for all the genotypes and you have seen the genomic organization also it's a very complicated genome people have tried many different vaccines inactivated vaccines subunit vaccines vectored vaccines and dna vaccines some have given partial protection against one genotype or few genotypes but not against all some have failed there are some attenuated viruses that can be used but the problem is it, it will protect only against the parent virus strain or within the same genotype there are some chinese companies that have come out with attenuated vaccines but they have reverted to virulence so please do not use please do not use any vaccines that claim to be from attenuated strains especially that are marketed from china they are not good vaccines at all and another thing is even if you vaccinate and there is disease in your neighborhood then you will not be able to differentiate between the vaccinated animals from the unvaccinated and infected animals that is what we call diva the differentiation of infected versus the vaccinated animals it becomes very difficult so the lab will return a positive result for your serology but you don't know whether it is because of the vaccine or because of the infection and as i told you the genome is very complicated genome that's why it is very difficult to get a proper vaccine strain or a proper vaccine or even a subunit vaccine for that matter because it's very complicated uh, there are people who have worked in this field for almost 30 years just studying the different proteins and immune responses and they have not been successful so far until recently in 2020 there was a publication from the usa from plum island uh, this group has developed a uh, they are claiming to develop a highly efficient uh, african swine fever virus vaccine this is through the deletion of uh, a particular gene it's called i117l gene it's a leader proteinase gene uh, so this region is conserved across all the virus isolates uh, all the genotypes 
uh, it is transcribed as late as in the virus replication cycle so it is not part of the virus replication cycle uh, the deletion of this gene ensured that the virus was still replicating so this gene is not required for the virus but we don't know why this gene is there in the virus however the replication can happen only in primary swine macrophage cells that means you need to have fresh swine macrophages from the lungs or from the blood to culture them the limitations are the culture systems how many people can culture the swine macrophages feasibility what is the volume or how many flasks you will make or how many liters you will make is very difficult there are no alternative cell lines and then this is possible only in countries where there is no asf because you can collect primary pores and macrophages from healthy animals but in endemic countries you don't know which animal is healthy and which animal is chronically infected or subclinically infected or which is not showing any symptoms in that case getting these cell lines or cells will be very difficult so that is a limitation for this vaccine but we'll be watching this space to see if they make any improvement in any cell line or try to culture the same uh, uh, virus in a different way maybe a vector vaccine or a dna vaccine so we'll be watching this space uh, coming to the final part the take home message it's a very highly contagious disease that everybody should be looking for now especially in pigs to differentiate from classical swine fever it can spread rapidly through pig population uh, one important thing is we have a good vaccine for classical swine fever now the icar has released this vaccine the ibri has made these vaccines previously the classical swine fever vaccine was made from rabbits now they have a cell cultured vaccine so there is a good vaccine available so if your animals are vaccinated if the pigs are vaccinated for classical swine fever and such a symptom occurs so you can suspect it is african swine fever it can spread rapidly and wipe out the pig population in days genotype 2 is known for pig to pig transmission avoid feeding swill to to the pigs or if you can't avoid cook the swill before feeding more than 70 degrees celsius for at least 30 minutes identify the clinical signs early and isolate and slaughter the animals disinfect the premises the laboratory diagnosis is very very important for differential diagnosis if you identify soft ticks on the animal's body talk to your parasitologist from your uh, departments your friends or from the veterinary school or college nearby avoid hunting wild pigs and feeding the offal to the domesticated pigs the main thing is in rural settings we should advise our farmers to house the pigs properly get away from an extensive farming practice to an intensive farming practice by giving them proper shedding and houses thereby you can control the entry of wild boars you can do the tick control properly and this is a major societal problem feral pig population so we have to control the feral pigs in our areas because feral pigs not only transmit asf csf they also transmit other diseases of zoonotic importance like uh, yellow fever japanese encephalitis etc so control of feral pig population is also very very important and that brings to the end of my talk hope you guys would have followed my talk uh, i thank the hurricane vets charitable trust for giving me this opportunity uh, dr david williams who is the expert for asia from the oie uh, he is from our, uh, our laboratory he is the response person uh, he is an expert on this uh, there is a global framework called global asf research alliance where the plum island center the perbright institute and our institute are collaborators and friends this is a small uh, presentation of whatever i have learned and what i have experienced and i have shared this knowledge with you there are infinite myths within the myths there is an eternal truth what's the truth we got the virus now who sees it all varuna has 1000 eyes indra has 100 you and i have only two 
So with these two eyes, we need to identify the disease, differentially diagnose the disease, and help our nation to control the disease. Thank you. Yeah, my uh, the question that I put in chat, same thing. Like, what is the concentration of citric acid? Is it 0.2% or 2%? 0.2%. Point, thank you, thank you. 0.2%. 0.2%, okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nagendra Kumar, it's an excellent uh, presentation, informative presentation. First of all, we thank you so much for such good presentation. Uh, being a DNA virus, uh, how uh, it is possible for this virus to have this many genotypes? Yep, it's a double stranded DNA. Yes. Uh, and as you see, it has got a lot of protein coding regions, ORFs. And then the variable region is the P72 protein. It's a variable protein. So the classifications of the genotypes are based on this particular protein. Uh, so that's why you have different genotypes. Okay, okay. So one of the question is from Dr. Ardhana Riswaran. So he has asked, how do I do surveillance for the disease, serology or PCR? So we don't know whether the disease is there so far in uh, southern part of India. So only thing that we can do is surveillance. And in surveillance, as I said, PCR is the main thing. But you can also do serology. But if you don't have the disease, what's the point in doing a serology? But it's always a package for this disease. So your sample should contain materials to do both PCR as well as for serology. But serology is very expensive because you need to get that kit from a private company. But for PCR, you can design primers. You can synthesize the primers that is available in the public domain. And then you can do a PCR. But I think the rules from government of India is that you need to collect these samples and send it to Bhopal lab. And they are the only lab who are authorized to do it at the present moment to confirm the disease. Okay, one of the person has asked a temperature for cooking kitchen waste. So in the presentation I have told it is at least 70 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes at least. So it has to be we really be cooking. And then if you add uh, organs like kidney, lung, or any of the tissues that could harvest the, harbor the virus, it should be for a more prolonged time. The minimum is 70 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. So one of the question is from Northeast, from I don't know which state he is, Dr. Warson Monsang, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, we in Northeastern states are more frequently affected with outbreaks of PWRS swine fever. Now they have ASF because of the geographical location or because virus is always present in the states. One thing could be geographical location because these states are locked states. So that means uh, they don't get any products from outside. And there is an infectious cycle within these places. And uh, it is sad to say that uh, these states have a very porous border with our neighboring countries, especially uh, with Myanmar on one side. They have a very porous border. And then as the history sh shows us, there are a lot of uh, illegal movement of people, illegal movement of animals from <laughs> Myanmar into uh, our country, especially in these northeastern states. So there could be a clandestine movement of animal and people and people moving these animal products into these states. Uh, that could have been the reason why ASF could have come into uh, uh, northeastern states. Uh, regarding uh, classical swine fever and PWRS, PWRS, same thing, it could have come from the neighboring countries. Classical swine fever is present in India, so it could be India is endemic classical spine fever. Now that we have a good vaccine, we can always control the disease. Hope I'm clear, Dr. Watson. Another question from Ranju Manoj. Uh, 
have you ever checked the heart ticks for this virus wild boars are infected heart ticks too now this virus survives in uh, soft ticks so far the heart ticks are not shown to be harboring this virus it's only the uh, ornithodorus genus uh, soft tick that has been shown to be permissive to this virus